so yeah, welcome. Uh, if you're wondering where you are, uh, this is a panel discussing digital marketing and analytics, which not surprisingly is part of the content and digital marketing track. Uh, some, uh, it's going to be a, a quick chat up here, so some quick introductions to get underway. Uh, so on the, on the panel here, we have Danielle Bartholomew, I got that right, who is a senior, strategi senior digital strategist at Media Current, which is uh, an agency. Uh, Specialising in dribble. Uh, Cheryl Little, I'll, I'll be old fashioned, I'll go with the women first. Uh, Cheryl Little, Director of User Experience, also a media current. And in the middle there is Bjorn Thompson, who is the Digital Experience Director at ImageX Media. Uh, my name's Jeff Burke, I'm the Web Development Business Partner at a government regulatory, regulatory agency called Technical Safety BC in Vancouver, uh, BC. So. Jumping straight in, uh, I looked at the registration list for this session, and we have quite a diverse range of, of uh, skills in the room. We have marketing people, digital strategists, content managers, communications people, uh, web managers, and so on. Uh, but my guess is most of you are involved in building and managing websites of various scales and, and creating the content for that. And so you know some of the challenges uh, that, you, that you're going to have, marrying design and creativity. Uh, in order to make that website uh, good and, and make users love to visit, uh, all the while making sure it's done in a quick and efficient way. Am I right about that? Everybody's on that page? Good stuff. Um, so, we'd, uh, make sh we're sure you're all going to make it a bit easier, so what we're going to do up here is discuss a bit more about how we're gonna d we might do this and hopefully give you some tips and ideas uh, for when you're actually tackling that same kind, those same kind of issues and challenges. So I'll start with a question or two, but if you have questions of your own, please don't hesitate to come up to the, speak, uh, the microphone at the start, either during uh, our discussion or we're going to leave a few minutes at the end as well. So uh, I'm going to start out with a, some questions and uh, just to lead it off. So, because uh, I'm going to be like the, the client of uh, talking to the... Uh, the experts here, so that's my approach on it anyway. So uh, my first question to the guys here is, uh, like where do you start? When you're, when you're going to start a, a new website or a new section of a website, uh, what are the first things that, that you are going to want to know so that you make that project a success? Anybody like to jump in there? I'll go. Sharing a mic here. Um, the first thing that I always love doing, and I'm kind of notorious for doing this. Um, I don't know if notorious is the right word, but I always ask a lot of why questions or questions to get at the why. How, how is what we're about to um, try to accomplish going to impact the organizational goals um, at the highest level? And then I try to work down to the weeds. So um, what are the organization goals that we're trying to do? How does this line up with the overall organization strategy? Um, and then making sure that, you know, we have the context around the challenge. So um, if anybody comes in, myself included, with kind of a uh, preconceived um, idea of like, this should be the solution, we kind of all get to check ourselves and say, how does this align with the overall strategy um, to make sure that we're not just coming in with an idea for a solution, um, but we're really starting at the ground, ground level. Um, one of the acronyms that I like to think about um, is called ROPE. It's a way to think through different questions. So first I want to talk about results. I want to talk about what are we trying to accomplish. I want to talk about opportunities of what, what's available for us to do, the problems, and then the execution. How are we actually gonna, going to do that? Um, so that's kind of the framework that I initially start with, and then um, getting more into the weeds after that. That's great. Um, yeah, so totally agree. Hopefully you can hear me. There we go. I totally agree. Uh, so yeah, definitely um, understanding at the high level what, you know, what's the rationale for this project? Why now? Um, you know, what, what, what would outcomes look like? Um, how can we actually measure uh, whether uh, the effort that's being spent and the time that's being spent, the money that's being spent on this project, um, how we can actually understand whether there's been value that's been achieved uh, is definitely critical. The other one I think that, uh, you know, we try to do as much as possible is to try to, you know, organize the project as much as possible around um, actual feedback from, from the users, getting, um, getting the actual customers and the end users into the process as much as possible. And, you know, obviously th that's something that, that a lot of projects say and, and, you know, try to achieve. Uh, but some of the things we've seen have a, a lot of value 
is really planning early for things like even getting the users into, let's say, the discovery process, like the on-site workshops, even inviting them, some of them to help kind of co-create some of the um, journey maps or the personas. Those can be really powerful ways to get, um, to get early buy-in, um, to start to um, lower the anxiety of people and to make sure that, that people feel that, uh, okay, the, the way that we're approaching this project um, and the way that we're conceiving of, of these features and solutions um, are already already being sort of, we're hearing from the users directly that these are things that they um, respond well to uh, and things that they want. Um, so obviously because getting users involved in projects takes early planning, usually on day one you're already behind on, on that kind of planning. Um, you know, just having, having a really good work back, uh, understanding day to day and week to week how you're going to go about uh, making sure that the business um, is being heard and that they have uh, the business goals are in front of you all the time, uh, and that you're you know, successfully kind of bringing in about some sort of validation um, regularly, not just one round of user testing, but regularly bringing in validation to make sure that um, the things that the business want are also desired by users, and you have a good sort of um, Venn um, diagram uh, where uh, the goals that you've set up, like what we talked about, um, are actually also running through the filter of, of whether this is actually something that is gonna add value. Yeah, it's very important that, to understand what your users' goals are when they arrive at the website. What are they there for? What do they, look, what, what do, what do they want to achieve? Um, when you understand that, it will give you a greater clarity of what your mission is. You begin the project. Thank you. Uh, now, the, the word personas was brought up just then. Um, and I'm sure everybody has a good understanding of personas. Can I see a raise of hands? Everybody? Okay, because well, we, we had a bit of a discussion before this session about the use of personas, and I actually brought up the point that uh, there's a guy called Jason Fried, who's, or Fr yeah, Fried, I guess, who uh, started the, uh, the project management tool Basecamp. And he said, personas lead to a false sense of understanding at the deepest, most critical levels. Um, so I just wanted to, and personally, when I w was first presented with some uh, personas, in fact, by Bjorn, uh, I was a little hesitant as to their validity and their usability, so I just wanted to find out from the guys what their take was on personas, how, how much you can use them, how much you rely on them, and, and how they fit in with the overall project structure. It's always Jeff throwing a curveball, too. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so I guess I can start on that one is, is um, you know, I think personas can have a lot of value um, to help um, the organization that um, is using them and the, the project team in general just have sort of easy and friendly ways of talking about um, the users and uh, what, what the users are trying to achieve, the pain points that they're running into. But like any tool, they have limits. Uh, I think uh, if you treat them as the gospel and treat them as uh, the thing that you always come back to every time and aren't, um, A, aren't supplementing them with actual data. So, you know, it is a very common situation where a persona will be written in a committee, uh, often in an on-site on day one or day two. <laughs> you kind of sketch them out on the board, you know, using the sort of lean UX uh, approach, um, which is, has a piles of value um, to get ideas out and start, uh, start to get the, the project moving forward. Um, but if they stop there, then in some ways, not necessarily that you failed, but you probably aren't going as far as you could to really get buy-in and get a, a persona that's actually going to add business value. Um, so I think, um, Danielle, we were talking earlier about this, of just how um, the persona needs to be kind of a living, breathing, breathing thing that, A, isn't the only thing you're looking at. You should also be doing, um, pilot, you know, a good amount of original sort of user research, competitive analysis, and other, other, other sort of ways of gaining insight. Uh, but that also the persona should be added to, and uh, the persona should be evolving uh, as you learn more about your business, as you're talking to your sales folks, as you're talking to the users, and understanding um, exactly, um, you know, um, exactly what users want from the site, uh, whether these personas are actually the right, the right way to split it, um, whether there's sub-personas you might want to look at, all, all those kinds of things um, should, uh, shouldn't just stop in that initial on-site. Uh, so you, you do the on-site and then you get the sort of project brief that shows you your four personas. Uh, it should always be, um, so we're moving beyond that, a fairly limited uh, effort. Um, in a previous role, I uh, led the marketing for an agency that I worked at, and um, I'm a big advocate for personas. I could probably talk about it for the rest of this time, but I'll save you guys from that. Um, catch me later if you want to do that. But uh, one of the things that I looked at is we had personas that were basically handed to me and said, here are their personas. Um, and I started just like peppering my team with a bunch of questions. So tell me how does this person think and how does this person think? And the way I was pr approaching it is I want to know this person like they're my best friend, right? I want to know how they think. I want to know, um, 
I want to know how they would react in different situations. What are the challenges that they're facing? How can I help um, better whatever it is that they're, they're looking for? Uh, and in order to, to have a, a strong relationship with someone, you need to keep asking questions. You need to keep learning about them. You're not just going to say, I've asked you five questions, so now I know everything about you. You keep asking questions. Um, so what my process was, uh, as I was kind of managing personas, uh, I would, anytime we had a, a new client come on board or um, a new even sales prospect, I would go and talk to the sales team and you know, get all of the basic information. What are they looking for? Um, what are they interested in? But then I would start asking questions about their personality because I wanted to know them more. Um, and then uh, I would you know, consume all of that information and then start um, kind of categorizing it and, and trying to figure out how do those fit into our overall idea of who our personas are. Um, but keeping in mind, just to reiterate one of the things that Bjorn said was, um, it is just a tool. So um, shifting the, the mentality of how you do personas to have something that works for your organization. If you have you know, a, a slide deck of six personas that were handed to you and you've never looked at it again, um, that is obviously not a format that works for you. So finding one, uh, finding a format or a process that works for you to gather and collect all that information that you can refer back to, I think is one of the key points of making sure that you don't have that false sense of understanding um, because you're continually asking questions, you're continually updating it and referring back to it. Uh, for me, that was a Google Doc, and I would just update it regularly. If it's a slide deck, that's awesome. If there's another tool that you use, um, there are so many different tools out there. Um, but making sure that when you see it as a tool, and there's you know there's room for um, room for weaknesses in it, um, but also doing something that's in a way that is going to be valuable to you and how your organization works. I really like the idea of Google Docs in general, just kind of as a living document. Mm -hmm. Somehow, when you put something in a slide deck. Um, <laughs> You might look at it on Monday and then look at it on a Monday two years from now. Yeah. Um, just the, na the nature of, of static documents. Um, so I totally agree with that. Yeah, user personas are also very valuable when it comes to understanding what device types they're going to be using to access your website. If you need to concentrate more on a mobile or a tablet because that user maybe accesses it while they're out in the middle of a field somewhere. Or maybe they're at, at, a, at a, de a desktop computer because they're researching your site <coughs> while they're at work. So understanding. The, the device and also the marketing channels that are being used to target them and, and maybe like as an email marketing campaign or as a social media, what, what are the best ways to reach those people? So Jeff, you got oh yeah, answers. so I was just about to ask, yeah. any questions? So. Yeah. That is a, a big challenge. Um, <laughs> I hear you. So uh, are they coming at it from a perspective of here's the feature of product X, here's how it benefits uh, user A? Is that kind of how they're formatted right now? Like, but when someone isn't yet an advocate, like, mm -hmm. you know. 
are they open to conversations? Like, can you ask them questions about, tell me more about how you came to this conclusion on this line about the persona? Oh, yeah. Would you be able to, you know, looking at the user paths, or if you have it connected with you know, Salesforce or, or uh, yeah, Part Otter? Um, yeah. So to say this person bought it, um, or bought whatever product you're right. selling, uh, here's what they looked at. Can we have a conversation about help me understand maybe how this lines up with their personas, here's what I'm seeing that they actually went through. Let's have a conversation about do we see any patterns or trends? Yeah. Um, because it, it could be helpful. Um, the way I always try to, to get buy-in is figuring out how is it going to benefit them. Um, yeah, so if there's ways that you can say 40% of people before they buy product X are looking at these two blogs or are looking at this, um, let's figure out why that pattern exists. Um, and maybe that's something that now that becomes a part of their lead generation or their lead nurturing process where they're sending a specific case study or a specific blog or a specific page on the site. Um, well, I can yeah. pull back my business. That's good. But it's <laughs> like, the, the, the tough thing is having them send these personas to the sales team sure. and around the whole company, yeah. like this informing, like, oh, this is who buys and why. And I'm like, you know, I want to add to that story so that my sales people can do a better job of having a, a good conversation, not just based on our future benefits, mm -hmm. but on what they, as a, as a consumer of the product, mm -hmm. are looking to do. But mm -hmm. I see, I like your, um, like, 40% of people mm -hmm. have looked at this mm -hmm. and done that. That's, yeah. that's um, one other quick thought, and then I'll let yeah. someone answer, else answer, too. <laughs> Um, looking at uh, maybe how they came to this site and what they're actually searching for, that might help your conversation on um, why they're why they're buying. Yeah, I like the idea of using data too, like you mentioned, Danielle. Um, I can also foresee maybe something even like an A/B test or some sort of um, way that you can sort of run uh, either A/B or multivariate test that um, that maybe test either a value proposition or or whether the hypothesis that the um, personas currently represent. Um, can actually match well against um, either an alternative hypothesis or additional data that you're, that you're hearing or you're getting for your customers. Again, I guess we're similar points about just, you know, making the case with data and, and being able to show um, show the, the product team that, uh, yeah, these personas are absolutely a great start. There's, there's, there's great data here. Uh, and maybe, like we are talking earlier, they can evolve and, and, and be receptive and be sensitive to new data that's coming in. Yes. So in behavior data, you're referring to like analytics? Yeah. That sort of thing. How people are using your website. Yeah. Well, I hear you saying. Whether they're, you know, whether they're converting or they're yeah. not converting, yeah. you know, there's a ton of data available. There is. On how they behave. That, that data is great. There's lots of great data from uh, heat maps, great data from analytics software, Omniture, you know, Google Analytics, whatever it might be. Um, just my, what I found personally is that data is great for showing us um, problem areas, weaknesses, things to look at, opportunities. It doesn't always tell us um, sort of why something's happening, and does, doesn't always tell us, um, you know, um, what when we're seeing like a problem or some sort of breakdown, uh, what what's causing that, uh, and wh what what is the user's emotional state when when they're when they're encountering that problem. Um, so um, personas are, can be part of helping with that for sure. Um, also, like, you know, things that machines can't tell us yet. I'm sure they will next year. Uh, <laughs> it's just like uh, you know, watching a user walk through your website. Just something as simple as that, like watching three or four users walk through your website, uh, assigning them some some common uh, goals or tasks, and, and 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 seeing, you know, whether the hypothesis hypotheses you formed um, through you know behavioral data are actually holding up, uh, or whether that's yeah, data too. That's actually one hundred percent. That is you not, totally agree. Modeling a, a yeah, or and it, personas may not be. You're absolutely right. So if you're including data as like qualitative and quantitative in that then you're absolutely, that's like, to me personally, that's by far the most valuable stuff. Um, whether a persona comes out of that or whether it's just like summary of, of insightful quotes from, from users or, or like a list of like patterns that you're hearing, I think those all have value. I don't think you have to choose one or the other. If a persona isn't, isn't, isn't resonating in your, in your organization, as long as the data that you're looking at um, <coughs> is actually showing you um, really sort of high ROI uh, information, I don't think it, it's necessary to have a persona. I still think it's valuable, but. One quick thought on that. Yeah. I think uh, 
personas can look different depending on whatever organization and making sure that you're just including the valuable information. Um, it could be seen as a way to name a pattern. So maybe there's three patterns through your website. It could be, you know, Cheryl is pattern one and this is how they move through. Um, being able to do that helps everyone have kind of a common language about how to address um, different decisions that need to be made. Um, I think it, uh, something that we can fall into is, uh, you know, looking, Googling what a persona is and making sure you're including all the same information that everyone across the internet is doing. Um, but if it's not relevant to you, I don't see any purpose in including it, just making sure there's the value that you need out of them. Yeah, I know a lot of personas have like day in the life, they have all these different yeah. categories. Sometimes it's just, it's just pain points and goals is really all you need to see. And from and, a design really, perspective, yeah. sometimes they can come in a lot of value, especially when you're talking about age ranges of people. A uh, site you're going to design for an 18-year-old is going to look a lot different than a site you're designing for someone in, in the 50s, right? But so, Google Analytics will tell you how old your users are. Yes. True, but, but you, I think the user persona development, you more understand what exactly their goals and their challenges and their emotion, emotional states, essentially, which can also be helped convey with design, and you're not going to get that out of analytics. Just on that note, and from a question of my own, is yeah. if you would, uh, if you had a limited budget and limited time, yeah. what would be the go-to uh, to tools or, or methods you would use? Would it be analytics? Would it be surveys? Would it be building user flows? Uh, is there a, a hierarchy of, of how, how big is this budget, Jeff? <laughs> Ten dollars. <laughs> Fifty hours. Um, so <laughs> there's a. I'll just say I feel like. All, I feel like all the above is, are accomplishable within a fairly small budget. If we, uh, we may be thinking about different numbers or different ideas of, of small, small means. Uh, but like analytics, okay. The vast majority of organizations have Google Analytics installed. Um, somebody who's skilled at extracting meaningful num numbers from that and not just looking at aggregates, um, dr drilling down and getting good slices of data, um, that's going to have value. And it's not going to take that much work. Maybe even a few hours will probably give you something useful. Um, user flows are things that um, probably don't, they could consume 500 hours, or they could consume five hours. Um, and I think even the five hour effort is often worth, worthwhile if you, if you do it right. And there's one more thing that you mentioned. Surveys? Surveys, yeah. And testing probably as well, user testing? Obviously there are universities that have entire programs to teach people about research methods and qualitative and quantitative data. So you can go like all out and creating like very like well vetted surveys that have like incredibly um, you know, strong statistical validity. Or you can do a quick survey um, that asks a few questions, um, get it out relatively quickly, and get some great data back. And, and both are great approaches. But even for a small project, surveys, I think, have quite a lot of value. Uh, especially if you can, depends on how big of a sample size you have and how, how much you can pester them um, and, and tap them on the shoulder. But uh, yeah, I, I, I like all three of those methods. Do you use user testing? Of, of course, I <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice prompts. Appreciate that. Definitely user testing. But I guess, like, I guess that's the question is, if like some organizations, uh, they're either are, are concerned about um, bothering their, their customers, maybe their customers are very high value, maybe their customers are CEOs. Um, so sometimes user testing is very possible, like for a university can test um, prospective students, prospective parents and stuff like that. If, you, if your product you sell to 500 people around the world and each one of those is worth 50 million or 100 million dollars, you might be a little more hesitant to ask them to come in and click through a website. Um, so you know, there's various ways you can get to this, this data. Yeah, I think by uh, th talking about the project and the goals of the project probably also has to be, it's, it can't be this like a recipe that mm -hmm. this is always the go-to thing because all projects are so different exactly. and it really depends on what your aim okay. is. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> okay, yeah. we good. Any more questions there? Um, so I have a, a phrase that I ask uh, or tell my people at work, don't believe everything you think. Um, so it's, and it's often true, I think, that we, uh, we create content by ourselves for people who are not like ourselves. And so it, it's often a challenge to um, keep pushing people to uh, think unlike ourselves. And one thing we talked about earlier was accessibility and how when we talk about accessibility, um, we, we typically think about colors and screen readers and stuff, but Cheryl actually had some really interesting ideas on that, and I was just wondering if you could share that. Sure. With Cheryl. 
Uh, accessibility is not just for those who are, are disabled individuals trying to access the internet. It also affects me when I'm on my mobile phone in a really dark room, or I'm out in the middle of a field and I, don't, I have really low Wi-Fi. So there's a lot of other considerations outside of just disability considerations that need, you know, that, that can affect someone's ability to access your website in a experience that's not going to make them go away really quick. Absolutely. That was a really interesting point that you had about uh, not just thinking about, um, you know, people who, who might have disabilities, it's also about, like, the various contexts of use and conditions that people would yeah. use that. That's great. Can you give us some examples uh, of uh, how you've implemented that in, uh, in different projects you've had? As far as uh, the, co the content? The, yeah, the, like the, how, you've, how you've thought about the project in, in those terms, in, you know, in, in terms of uh, you know, um, bad access to Wi-Fi, the you know, people like me who are having trouble reading as we get older, that kind of thing. Sure. How, how do you, how do you build that? Font sizes are really important. <laughs> Uh, font sizes, we have, you know, standard best practices of the smallest font size you'd ever want to use on a mobile device. You don't want to go smaller than, you know, like, for exam example, 14 to 15 pixels. Um, you can break your content up in smaller bite-sized chunks so people with cognitive disabilities can, can absorb the information more easily. Um, breaking, adding subtitles and clear titles to all of your paragraphs so someone understands what they're getting ready to delve into deeper. Um, giving them you know, clear pathways to access the information by having your header tags all in the correct order so that as they're you know, using their screen readers to go through the page, they're not you know, fumbling all over the place and going from the top and the bottom and sideways. So those considerations are really important when it comes to content as well as like Wi-Fi access, the size of your images that you add to your website, you know, that can really slow down the, the amount of functionality and, and interactivity that you add if there aren't care careful considerations made during the development process, you can really slow down the, the time and effort it takes to load a page. Yeah. And I guess uh, as Google pays more attention to signals about usability, like performance, um, mobile friendliness, uh, you know, semantic, the semantic nature of, of um, the way that the page is constructed and how easy it is to find stuff, and even metrics like engagement, um, you know, that there's the argument um, to be made to sort of make the site more inclusive and, the, and to make the site um, just more available to more people. There's also just an ROI and like a, a business argument to be made that um, that doing these things is kind of the way the web is going anyway. Uh, and the w and a lot of the um, the companies that are let's let's not say in charge of our lives, but influence our lives, um, <laughs> have you know they're they're really paying attention to all these things we're talking about. Um, and uh, you know they're they're starting to not starting to already uh, factoring that deeply into the rank the ranking alg algorithms. I'm talking about Google when I say they. <laughs> but other, other, I mean, that's just in general, that's, that's kind of like a huge, we're getting reports now on like, um, whether the touch area on, on mobile sites is, is, is wide enough um, from Google Search Console and things like that, so, yeah. So just to continue our <coughs> discussion with those influencers, those big companies that, that are not to be named, um, there's obviously, one of the, the I know Google uh, factors is dwell time and the the amount of time that users are spending on the, on on the, the content. Um, that that brings into the the question long pages and how uh, if you do put all of your content on one page, which is quite a common design Im implementation these days, where you just scroll and scroll and scroll. The question is how does that? How do you feel about those? I mean, given that it could affect. Uh, search engine optimization with what are you what are your keywords? How do you are you keeping you know you people finding the right information on that page? Or how do you go about uh, dealing with that kind of concept now that that's becoming quite quite common? Um, one of the things that I always try to run through um, the filter is or a filter that, that I think through is. Um, humans first, like we're gonna design for humans and, and what they're looking for. And you know, if you have a good understanding of who your personas are, and you know that all of you know, this amount of information um, needs to be on, the, uh, on a specific page and that's what they're looking for, um, then I think that that's great. Uh, I think the, the pattern of just how technology has shifted, cell phones are obviously becoming more and more popular, more and more people are having um, smartphones, then scrolling is just becoming 
normal. It's what people do. Like, I don't know if you guys have gone up to your laptop and tried to scroll before. Um, I definitely have. Um, so it's just, it's becoming something that people are anticipating anyways. Um, so as long as it doesn't hinder that user experience, if it doesn't hinder um, what your users need to get out of a specific page, um, I think that there's a lot of positive things to having a design style like that. Agreed. I think it depends on what you're trying to um, what you're trying to explain or what you're trying to persuade in the, on that page. You know, there's lots of there's lots of great conversion case studies of long pages versus short pages, like Crazy Egg did. Uh, um, did one, conversion rate experts did one, um, that showed uh, in their cases, I think Modest did one as well, that long pages vastly outperform short pages. But I think um, you can't just make that decision uh, without understanding um, you know, what your users, how much your content users can absorb, A, how much they're looking to absorb, how, how much they need to know before making a decision. Um, we've seen our, in our own research on non-product sites like um, recreation centers and higher education sites, um, more and more users are, are becoming imp more impatient with a little bit longer pages uh, and looking, uh, looking for things to be um, sort of truncated, especially like if they perceive even one block on that page to be irrelevant, it's, 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 they, it's a disproportionately negative um, impact to that. They're like, why is this so long? A lot of times they, when they look at it on desktop, they say, oh, this is fine. And then they go on the phone, they're like, I'm lost. There's seven or eight sort of sections here and I'm, I'm really struggling to figure out you know, how this all relates. So I think, you can, long pages can work really well, as long as they're extremely well structured, tell a story very clearly, and if they're the right um, choice, and you've, and you've considered the short versus the long, and how much information you need to present to people, because people don't read on about anyway, they just, they just scan, so, a lot of time. So, and this again is from a personal experience that we're going through right now, is with long pages, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of times people will say, well, let's just accordion those up, so you just see the, the, the one line, and people can, expand those whenever they want. I'm, I'm in two minds about that, given that you, if you're hiding content uh, in any way, shape or form, you're actually, by taking that out of the, the user's view, it's compromising the content. Do you have any, any ideas on that? Kind of depends on the content. Um, if it's extremely long, text-heavy content, and there's four sections of long, text-heavy content, do you want your user to scroll through all of that on a mobile device? Or by providing them the title in a collapsed format so they can see all four titles at once and say, oh, I want the one that's number four, not the one that's top. So that kind of saves them time and maybe user frustration of having to scroll. So on a mobile devices, it can come in handy. But like I said, it's important of what content you're talking about. Certain things you're certainly not going to want to bury. For example? Um, sure, like um, a higher education website, they have a whole list of courses and within each, under each course title they have like a description and the date and all the information about that particular course, but maybe there's 40 courses on this page. So we don't want the user to have to scroll through all that content. They're just looking for the course title and we know that. So they can find the course title and then expand it to see the information that they're desiring. And we, oh, there's a question. Yeah, so <laughs> as long as you don't make me stand up, I guess it's fine. Um, uh, please stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, <laughs> um, when we talk about the, the scrolling fatigue for narrative structures, again, this is not B2B, just yeah. this is me yeah, trying to tell compelling stories about how awesome my university is. Um, how do you combat that? Right, right. Yeah, I guess like um, we've definitely seen like a 70% if, if people are, so you said a 70% drop off, is that right? So 30% of people are making it to a... Yeah, only like 30 people are making it to the very, very end of the story. Right. And so we're obviously structuring things to where the most important bits are at the top, but we're trying to be creative with embedding different kinds of media throughout the stories, sure. not only to encourage people to keep scrolling, but because it looks stupid when you just jam all the stuff on the first two yeah. graphs. Do you know what I mean? Totally. So we're trying to be intentional about it. Have you yeah. tried A-B testing? 
we have not as often as we should, but that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. There's also like things that kind of you may, which you may be employing already, uh, to help people kind of jump to sections that might be relevant to them. Uh, like I know a lot of sites use you know in, in context menus and jump menus that kind of stick, are sticky. This kind of a tactical UI element, uh, but just different ways a of, of letting people know. Let's say they're on the admissions page um, or they're on the you know tuition and financial, financial aid page, um, and they they want to see um, scholarships. They want to see um, you know the process of, of applying. They want to see um, you know various various pieces of data, like five pieces of data, let's say five big buckets. Um, structuring that information so they can jump to the point four quickly or point five quickly is really really helpful. A little bit trickier on a small screen, but there's ways of doing that. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Um, also, with regard to content on on web pages, and again, this is from my past experience. I've always wondered whether it should be one page, one one purpose. So you come to the site, you go to the page, and you hit a page, and the information you get on that page is uh, itemized. It's, it's your, your at atomic page, for example. And an example that I can point to is Nielsen, which is a usability website. And if you go to one of their web pages, they will have in red at the top essentially a summary of what this page will be, what, what the user is going to get from this page. Um, I've tried to push that into my company's website, but got pushback. Um, so my question is, is that a good idea? Uh, and if, if not, why not? <laughs> um, I'll take a stab at that first. Uh, I think every question of good or bad is, you have to look at the context of it. Um, the way I would approach it is looking at the topics that you want to talk about and then thinking about how is the user going to consume this information? So if they always consume A, B, and C, and then sometimes D, um, having A, B, and C together might make sense. Um, and then they can go to D if they need more information. Uh, but really thinking about how is the user going to consume this information? And maybe, maybe they look a little bit different to like the internal um, content editor, but maybe to the consumer, all of or the the customer, all of this information is the same. Um, so I'd probably start asking those questions before I would make like a blanket statement of always have you know one specific topic max of three hundred words or you know any yeah. restrictions on the page. I do like the idea though, Jeff, of kind of telling them what you're going to tell them up front mm -hmm. as early as possible, and having some sort of nut graph early. <laughs> um, and you know, we all, all a, lot of, a lot of these. Um, kind of topic areas have come back to like what our users want and what, what are their goals and what are their primary goals. Um, if, if a user does come to a page and they can't tell fairly quickly if the information they came to the page to get uh, is available on that page, I think it can be demotivating. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked about like various techniques, like obviously um, Nielsen Norman um, does the sort of the sort of nut graph at the top, which is a great idea. Or you know having some sort of, um, sort of menu way to sort of scroll through the, the content you want. Or just make it clear to the user, um, or shortening the page, or all kinds of different ways you can do that. I think the key goal is, um, do I have to scroll down four screens to find that one piece of information that I want? And do I even know that that's even available on this page? So that's the art and the science. <laughs> A lot of art. Um, so we're, we're coming into the last uh, seven minutes. So uh, I'd ask if there are any questions that are still out there in the field. Please put your hands up. Yes, we have a winner. It's kind of tentative hand. Yeah, tentative hand. And there's a microphone right there, which Lisa's going to help you with. So talking about analytics, um, what are some key metrics? And I'm bad. But <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my assigned thing yeah. here. Um, what are some key metrics that you guys look at that you use to then better optimize, better um, design your website for your user. Um, it was funny because we talked about it a little bit in one of the earlier sessions of sometimes the most easiest metrics that you can pinpoint are not always the ones that you want to look at, such as bounce rate. Um, so can you guys, what do you look for and what metrics do you look at and really use in designing and optimizing your website? That is a big question. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's me right. I'll get you a list later. No, a lot of it is, you know, 
I keep going back. I feel like a broken record, but a lot of it uh, is associated with your goals, right? So um, I like to look at bounce rate, but whether or not bounce rate is good depends on what my goals are. If it's a conversion page and people are bouncing after that, then you know maybe that's okay. Or um, if it's something that I, it's the entry level page and I want them to navigate through the site, a high bounce rate is not good, and I need to to take a look at that. Um, you know, if there's if it's a blog page and the time on site is 10 seconds, um, well, that's probably not good because who can read an entire blog in 10 seconds? Um, so a lot of it deals with, with the context, but I typically start with a lot of the engagement metrics. How many times are people um, visiting a site Are they or a, a specific page? How often are they going to the next page that I want them to go to? Um, I think looking at things like conversion rate, um, are they, you know, a, like, are they accomplishing the goals that you want them to on the site, or are they um, bouncing off? Um, I like to look at, you know, the most frequent pages people are visiting. Um, I like to look at where people are exiting the site. Um, thinking through, feel free to chime in if you have others. Yeah, um, so I, de I definitely tend to fall more on the qualitative side, as you probably have guessed. I mean, <laughs> um, but I definitely feel strongly analytics are a really important part of, of, of the puzzle. Um, even just stuff like uh, understanding um, how behavior might be different from the from various uh, form factors like the mobile versus the desktop. Um, understanding, um, you know, how to prioritize the content and what and how much to pay attention to, knowing that we can't look at 500 or 5,000 pages. Maybe um, just understanding what pages um, are the, I mean basically are most popular that that actually um, get get heat and get traffic, uh, and then understanding. Um, that can not only help us understand where priority might go in terms of like um, best user experience, best content experience, but also just prioritizing things like navigation, like what should come first, what should come last. Um, those things definitely 100%. The information on demographics is also getting better and better um, of um, you know, gender, of age, of all these things. And that actually, that actually can be quite, I found quite useful. Um, certainly, it's most useful if you can disaggregate it as like instead of just looking at general bounce rate or general mobile use in, into some sort of slice um, that is actually meaningful and useful. Um, like type, you know, looking at um, users who dropped off uh, at a certain point, like what, what are some characteristics of that, of that user or, or their experience? And then I guess the other part, which doesn't come out of the box, but a lot of people do is, um, is actual like, conversion goals and, um, and actual um, tracking the, the journey. I think that's, that to me is often more valuable than seeing like, page depth or, or um, um, you know, mm -hmm. how a time on page, because time on page could be good or it could be not good at all, depending on, yeah, sorry. Just apologies, we have two minutes to go and then we're pretty strict on, on finishing up, so um, if you'd like to come up and talk to the experts, not me, just these guys, uh, after, the, after the talk, that'd be great. Um, and I might just finish with one quick question if we've got, to the, to, to the panel, just to shake him up a bit. Um, no, really, it's for you guys. Uh, for last two minutes, my question is, what is the most important skill you've learned on the job that you think the guys here could take away um, and into their practice? I'll take that. Um, being an advocate for the user, um, empathy, understanding where they're coming from, putting myself in their shoes, it's not about the company's goals necessarily, well, of course it is about the company's goals, but understanding who's visiting the website and just keeping that at top of mind with every decision that I make when I'm designing. Um, one thing that I started in the company in a sales role, uh, and you know, when you're on, a lot of times when you're on a sales call, you get sort of um, a handoff similar to this experience, actually, where you have somebody kind of moderating and kind of um, say, you know, here's Bjorn, he's coming in as the expert on something. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's very valuable for people to have um, really strong domain expertise. One of the things I've learned is to s be comfortable saying, I don't know, or let's find out, or, you know, I'm not, I don't have the answer at the ready right now. Because uh, a lot of times, um, you know, you, a lot of groups can look toward to uh, what they consider an expert or an agency to say, like, you know, tell us what, what, what we should do. Um, but I feel like best practices are great and important, uh, but have to be, um, you know, you have to factor in the uncertainties that, that we should, you know, acknowledge, look at, and uh, explore. Okay. 
Um, I can, yes, I can be quick. Um, asking questions, uh, being able to just be curious about whatever the challenge is, asking questions of, of all of the different um, people around the whatever the challenge is or whatever the uh, project is to get various, um, various perspectives and the context that you need to make good strategic decisions. Okay, I'd like to thank the panel and thanks very much for coming along this afternoon. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you guys so much.